What is going on, everybody? Football is back. After a tumultuous offseason full of uncertainty and controversy, this Sunday we can finally watch some Washington football. And welcome to the Washington Brawl podcast presented to you by the Brawl Network. I am your host, Parker Hamlet, joined by everybody's favorite hokey, Chris Fowler. Um, football's back, man. Kicks off tomorrow night. Um, the Fitness Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs take on Houston Texans in a primetime matchup. Um, we're gonna get right into it, Chris. Who you see coming out? Who do you see coming out on top there? It's Kansas City, man. It's no doubt about it. But I am so effing ready for football, man. It is killing me. I went to sleep last night, and I actually thought I woke up today thinking today was Thursday, so I was all hyped up and ready. But I gotta wait one more, one more sleep, as they call it. But yeah, man, I got Kansas City winning this easily. I mean, what is what do the Texans even have now? They got rid of D Hop. I think. I think uh, um, Deshaun Watson is going to come out pissed off at his uh, coaching staff, and I think he's going to tank the season. Ooh. He's going to tank the season. I, I, I think <laughs> the off is definitely going to be That was a bit of a hot take, but I'd be pissed if I was him. <laughs> Get rid of everybody, his only receiver, so, and give him the uh, 50-year-old Randall Cobb. So <laughs> if I was him, I don't, I don't know if I'd be too happy to be in Houston. 50-year-old Randall Cobb, 50-year-old Brandon uh, I think Brandon Cooks, and then you got David Johnson, who's on his last legs. You know, people are critiquing the Atlanta Todd Gurley signing, but I mean, when's David Johnson played a whole season? Don't get me wrong; it could work out well. But if I know Kansas City, and I know Patrick Mahomes, who just got cuffed by Kansas City, they're going to drop forty on him, man. It's 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 going to be very reminiscent of that playoff game. I think the Kansas City Chiefs going to start off one and zero. But like I said, football's back. And uh, speaking of uh, football, um, our Washington football team also has a brand new hashtag. Hashtag. Washington football. Chris, what do you think? I don't think anything of it, man. It is what it is. I I think it's weak for sure. It's uh, definitely not the way I would have gone. I think I thought WFT was the best. I mean, yeah, what, what's wrong with that? It's easy. Yeah, exactly. WFT, I, I don't know if anyone's going to get it, but who, who cares about hashtags, man? I, I I do like the little logo at the end of it, but they could have done that with any hashtag. So Fair. I don't know, I mean, man. We're, <laughs> I don't know. I think we got more problems to address in the hashtag, but I understand why we're talking about it. Well, last week we had special guest Mitch Chesler from Washington Football Talk on the show. Talk AP's release and hinted what we thought would come of cut day on Saturday. Um, the Washington Football team is now down to their final 53 to kick off the 2020 season, and we got plenty to talk about. Um, the team also put out its first depth chart um, that we're going to grade, even though Coach Rivera did clarify that it was unofficial. unofficial. Lastly, we're going to preview the week one matchup against Philadelphia and give our predictions as well as well as who you can rely on from the Watch football team in your fantasy lineup come Sunday. Um, but before we do that, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome our special guest and host of the Redskins Act podcast, our guy Rodney. Thank you for joining the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. The, uh, the invite. I'm looking forward to talking some football with you guys. And like you guys both said earlier, super, super excited to have NFL coming back, not only tomorrow, uh, but Sunday as well. So, yeah, thanks for having me, man. Rodney, uh, are... Rodney, are you in the man cave right now? I gotta say, I, I love this setup. I am. I am in the man cave, and that's why I'm still the Redskins addicts as well. I was, I was telling Parker before we started, over my left shoulder, if you can see that Redskins painting in the background, my uh, my good friend uh, from elementary school actually painted that for me. He's a huge Cowboys fan. I hate him for that. But <laughs> I, I love that painting that he put together. Um, got my little boxing set up back here. I got a an RG3 autograph rookie of the year jersey behind me. You m probably can't see that. I think my head's in the way. Oh, I can see it now. Here somewhere. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's a man cave. It's more so the family cave, though. Um, I got three small kids and a wife, so yeah, I try to make it the man cave. But yeah, it's a uh, it's an equal opportunity cave for sure. Do you have the uh, you have the liquor underneath the sign because the Redskins make you drink? Oh, f***ing absolutely. I'm sorry. I hope you guys cursing your pod, man. Yeah, absolutely. It is definitely the drinking organization. I hope that ends this year, man. Um, yeah, the Redskins, Washington football team would drive me to drink. I'm sorry if you have to edit out, man. I, no, sometimes. dude. You're wrong. man. That's why we brought you on. That's, that's okay. Talking. Let's f***ing go then. Okay, that's what I like to hear. Not only that, you, got, you got the punching bag in the background, so if things don't do, go too well on Sunday, you got I something I think I will out. go to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope it doesn't come to that, but yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a good addition to the man cave for sure. I just get flashbacks of last year's week one, but been interested to get you on the show since our huge DC Tweet Team crossover episode. Um, I know you guys are fairly new to the game a lot like us. Um, but you guys put out a great show every week. Thank um, you. One that some have noted is still named the Redskins Attic Podcast. Yeah. Um, anyone new to your show, um, 
that doesn't that didn't hear your explanation on the DC Tweet Team podcast, tell them a little bit more about you guys' decision to keep that name moving forward. Because as far as I can tell, you guys are all pretty well tenured fans. Yeah. So the at least I'll give you a little bit of synopsis between Redskins X or you know how we were kind of established. So 2015, we were going through the RG3 to Kirk Cousins kind of transition, and I was just. I was part of multiple Redskins groups on Facebook. Um, Redskins Twitter existed, but I wasn't really on Twitter that heavily then. But it was constantly incessant arguments about Griffin Cousins, Griffin Cousins. And I was like, dude, I need something different. Like, I'm addicted to the team, not a player. So that's why I created Redskins Addicts. We got Amen. away from the constant QB debate. Um, now, fast forward five years. You know, we've, we've got the group. There's about 4,500 of us on Facebook, 1,000 Twitter followers. Um, still want to try to pump those up because, come on, guys, uh, follow. But uh, <laughs> with the podcast, we just started in June this year. So it's been something we've discussed multiple times. We would go live on Facebook in the group but never had a podcast. So just established a podcast at the beginning of June, and you guys are all tracking. Roughly six weeks later, it's an announcement of, like, Hey, we're going to purgatory. We're going to do the name change transition. And then maybe a week or two later, Hey, we're going to be the Washington football team for this year. So we were like, well, hell, are we going to change the podcast? We're still trying to establish an identity, get folks to understand, you know, our look, the sound of our voice, et cetera. So I was like, you know what, until it's permanent with the name change, we'll remain the Redskins addicts. Now, if we become the Washington red wolves, red addicts, red hammers, who knows, then we'll change our name and we'll be, you know, addicted to that franchise or organization. But I just didn't want to say, hey, we're the Washington football team addicts because it sounds as stupid as that Washington football hashtag. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll save you the <laughs> save you the displeasure of getting into that. I know you, you feel just about the same as we do about that. Um, oh, my God. But I mean, do you favor a particular name? Um, I... I just whatever name we choose, I just I do not want it to be something that's going to turn into a controversial topic 10, 15, 20 years from now. So I'm in the military. I typically don't tell people that because it's such a cancel culture. You know, you say something that pisses someone off in the pot. They're like, oh, let's kind of cancel this guy's career. Um, but like the Red Tails came up. And they want to pay homage to Tuskegee Airmen. I was like, yeah, that's that's cool. Not bad. Almost instantly someone came out. Um, and it was like, you know, that's disparaging to like the black soldier. I was like, you know what? Screw this, man. Like, I, I don't want to deal with that. So yeah. do it some inanimate object or just like some animal, whatever. I'm good with that. Um, I just don't want to have the same controversy, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, after falling in love with a new team name, we're yeah. once again saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, the black veterans of America don't like the red tails because, you know, I'm so, so, I, do, I don't want to do it, man. I'm done with that. I mean, to me, that's just that's a lateral move. And, and they're just red flags with pretty much every name except for Warriors and Red Wolves. And I mean, yep. as you know, it's very split down the middle. We're a Red Wolves podcast. We're a little bit selfish about that. Um, but we hope whatever it is definitely favors out um, whatever, you know franchise you're going to be addicted to as far as your name is concerned so yeah absolutely man so, <laughs> something something easy man <laughs> yeah exactly and, you know i mean as long as it's marketed well i could care less man you see people going back and forth left and right about it and i'm just like look man as long as it's cool it's marketed well you know I, that's really all i care about like you said something easy to honestly be in everyone's favor so but absolutely. um speaking of the washington football team saturday they trimmed the roster down to 53 um made some moves that turned some heads and made some moves that hardly surprised anybody um so we're going to go down the list of cuts, starting with the big one. And that one is one we got into a little bit last week with Mitch Chisler, Um, And that's the newest member of the Detroit Lions, Adrian Peterson. Um, I definitely didn't feel like Adrian Peterson fit in to the scheme at all. You know, he's more of an eye formation guy, kind of puts his head down, you know, good between the tackles. Um, there, He's done really fit in a lot of these two back sets things that Scott Turner's trying to do. Doesn't really fit into the RPO, whole, whole RPO thing. Um, but to me, and Ronnie, I'll start with you. I feel like it was more of a AP for Peyton Barber kind of thing. And I think that's what rubbed me wrong about it. How did the release of Adrian Peterson make you feel on Friday? That, it makes me vomit just thinking of that. So, like, I, I'm looking at the Carolina Panthers stats from last year. And, like, and, and that's the thing. I was just talking to my other admins on the Redskins Axe, like the, the admin chat. And everyone's saying, hey, two back set, two back set. I'm like, two back set? Like, what, what games are these people watching? Because if you go back and look at the Carolina Panthers stats from last year – Scott Turner's offensive coordinator, 
you know, Rivera was the head coach for eight, nine weeks. Their leading running back, Christian McCaffrey. We all know that, dude. Who's their backup? I, you don't know. I, I don't know. I have to look it up. And exactly. looking at the stats, their backup running back would be Kyle Allen for attempts. So, oh I mean, Mc, McCaffrey had – I mean, granted, that's the quarterback running under pressure. But McCaffrey, 287 attempts. The next the highest attempts, Kyle Allen at 32. And then you had Curtis Samuel – with 19 rushing attempts and Reggie Bonifant with 16 rushing attempts. So this whole Reggie two Bonifant. backs, dude, like who is that? I don't, who is, I have no idea, but this whole two running back set, we got rid of a future hall of famer who we know can bang. And if you're going to say that Peyton Barber is going to be the AD AP equivalent, come on, you talk to Adrian Pearson and say, listen, dude, like you're getting old. We still know you can bang, but, we're going to keep you on the million dollar salary we had you on. Or no, we're going to keep Peyton Barber. Like, this is a joke. Wait, this is a joke. I'm getting that queasy feeling that sometimes accompanies jokes. Do I look like I am joking? No, but that's sometimes part of it. If I were joking, you'd be laughing. Do you look like you are laughing? Impossible to say. I can't see myself. I, it's, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I don't know about the two back set. I think it's, I think it's something that they want to do. But it's it pisses me off when you look at if you go look at all the camp notes, ninety one percent of the time Adrian Pearson was back there by himself, and then roughly a week and a half ago you start hearing about McKissick and and um, Gibson being on the on the field at the same time. You're like, okay, this is something new, and they cut AD a couple of days later. You're like, what the hell's going on? I hope it works out, man. They're coaches. I'm just a football fan, so we'll see what's what's going on with that. I mean, hearing them kind of hearing Rivera kind of oil up Peyton Barber because you know he was he played in the division with him. He's like, oh well, Peyton Barber can do this. Peyton Barber can do that. Peyton Barber is not Adrian Peterson, and it doesn't matter how old Adrian Peterson is at this point in his career. He's still a thousand yard rusher, you know, best case scenario. But I mean, he he's shown that he can still produce. I mean, that is a future Hall of Famer, and you're telling me that you can't keep that guy around, but you'll keep around around a guy like Peyton Barber, you know. Chris, do you feel like that's kind of the, the the mantra of this, if you will, that Peyton Barber is kind of taking over AP's role? Do you feel like that's a slap in the face? Do you feel like that's going to work out for the organization? I think Peyton Barber definitely took Adrian Peterson's roster spot. Uh, however, I don't think you know we're looking at Peyton Barber as being the replacement for Adrian Peterson. That's going to be Antonio Gibson. But, however, I do agree with both of you in saying that it's crazy to believe that Peyton Barber made this team and Adrian Peterson doesn't. Uh, and, and you want to talk about system, Adrian Peterson is going to be Adrian Peterson. If he gets the ball in his hands, he's going to run and get every yard he can. And he I remember when he came ones, <laughs> all literally whole training camp. He's practicing with the ones. That, exactly. I mean, that's just... And when he came to DC, everyone talked about how he was a downhill runner. How in the I formation he got, uh, you know, quarterback under center. He got some uh, some momentum going forward, and then he hit the hole and burst. And you know, we switched that up going in shotgun with him to the side and everything. But he still rushed for like a thousand yards every season he was with us. So he was going going to adapt. To the system he's in, and AP is just going to be AP. You can't tell me that Adrian Peterson would not have found any production in this system. I don't understand what there was to lose. I mean, you know, you, you think the biggest thing to lose is if they don't play him, then the question circulates: Why aren't you playing AP? I mean, I think that's the biggest concern here for Rivera. I mean, that's only that's the worst thing that could have happened. But just imagine if you're in a situation throughout this season where you need a powerhouse running back like Adrian Peterson to stick it in at the goal line or to, you know, to say a running back goes down, like, like let's pray it doesn't, but let's just say a running back goes down, AP steps in and it, we have effing AP as a backup. You know what I mean? It's just, they always say, like, you're only as strong as your weakest link. If our link is, our, if our weakest link was Adrian Peterson, we're in a really good spot. But That's now it's exactly. Peyton Barber. Exactly, dude. Like, and it it kills me. I'm looking at so I'm looking at 80s, you know, career stats. They say like he can't catch the ball. As a rookie, he had 19 receptions. You know, in 2012, his MVP season had 40 receptions, 348, you know, carries. Now, granted, it's not 2012. I don't expect him to do that. But he had 20 receptions in 2018, 251 rushing attempts, 17 receptions last year, 211 rushing attempts. He can catch the ball. He can do what you need him to do. I think if you're going to run that two back set, it he can still be a formidable spy or you know blocker. deterrence, or whatever blocker, whatever. We don't have a fullback. Like, <laughs> damn, dude. Like, oh man, I I get it. He still has the ego. He still has the burst. He wants to be a starting running back. I get that's it. That's what it is. But dude, and maybe that's why he was cut. 
maybe as outsiders or we're looking at it, maybe they're saying, hey, this dude still wants to start. We you all remember that famous, you know, instant b- behind um Sean Payton with AD is just rocking side to side with the thousand yard steer, pissed off because he's not in the game. Kamara is. Decided not to run it out. And here's some video from late in the first half. We have no idea what this is really about, but it was clear Adrian Peterson trying to get Sean Payton's attention to finally turn around. Sean Payton said, I know it's likely one of my running backs might be mad at me when the game's over because they're not getting the ball as much as they want. That's football. Maybe that is something that Ron Rivera didn't want to have, but it just still leaves a bad taste in your mouth. You're like, okay, I could have had Adrian Pearson coming in for a change of pace, thunder and lightning type back, and we got Peyton Barber. Come on, man. Can't do it. I think it's just he really wants just the element of surprise, I guess, with the offseason. And I, if you're going to get rid of Adrian Peterson, this was the way to do it. You cut him on Friday. Nobody else. You kind of make Friday about Adrian Peterson. You know, you say thank you, all this other stuff. I think the biggest part of it, Ronnie, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's just the fact that they were going to give him a limited role in this offense, and he wasn't going to agree to that, plain and simple. Yeah, I, th- I think, think that's, that's the case. I think that's the case, but it's it's – it sucks when, like, you're looking at Yahoo Sports and CBS, whatever, and they're saying, hey, Adrian Pearson's probably going to start for the Lions this week. <laughs> exactly. That, if, oh, my God. Listen, 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 listen. Last year when Jay Piss Pump Gruden sat him down for week one and we had, like, 1.8 rushing yards with guys per attempt. But, dude, if that shit happens again and, like, I look I look at ESPN and Adrian Pearson had 97 yards and a touchdown – and we had like 13 rushing yards. Just write my There's obituary. no competition over there. DeAndre <laughs> just... Swift, Karan Johnson. Oh Chris my God, man. I mean, nothing. He's already there back. I mean, that's, that's now, I, it's funny because I'm raging on this podcast, but I hate Madden, but I do play it because I, I like the NFL. I traded Adrian Pearson to the Chargers for a tight end. So, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, my God. Hey. <laughs> so at, least I'm t- at least I'm telling you the truth, man. It's a Let's digital move truth. On, man. Let's move on. <laughs> it's something to think about, though. I mean, would it have even been worth if, if Washington knew they were going to move on from Adrian Peterson? Do you wait until you have an opportunity to trade him for any type of value? I mean, is that a possibility? I just see way more upside I'll- in bringing in a Devontae Freeman or I just I'm still not a fan of the of the Peyton Barber signing. I, I just don't see it. You know, he wasn't even the best back in Tampa Bay. I mean, of course, he's got a lot of experience. He had a lot of volume there. But I mean, no one was ever like, man, you, you better pick up Peyton Barber off the uh, waiver wire this week, guys. He's going to blow up. I, and, and now he's pretty much filling in for Adrian Pearson's role in that offense. Rivera can tell me to not sleep on him all he wants. But at the end of the day, I've seen Peyton Barber play. You know, and, and I really don't see a lot out of him. So he makes. I'm guessing asleep. he's not on your fantasy. I guess he's not on your fantasy team, Parker. Uh, we'll get into that later. I mean, what Washington football team can you can like wholeheartedly put in your fantasy lineup and be confident in it? But that that is for later. Um, some of the other notable cuts on the offense are a former third round um, draft pick Ross Pierschenbacher. I fi- I spent more time figuring out how to tr- how to spell his name than I think any of us spent talking about him in his tenure here. Um, he went to the practice squad. Um, late season wonder, tight end Hill Hinges um, also went to the pra- practice squad. Another Alabama guy, um, Josh Gosh, uh, guard Josh Garnett, who we spoke about a little bit, little bit about last week. Um, wide receiver Tony Brown, um, undrafted free agent quarterback Stephen Montez, um, and lastly, the long term project known as Cam Sims. Rodney, how are you feeling about that? I know a lot of people are Cam Sims guys. I mean, personally, I am too. But I mean, I, this this wide receiver room just has too much upside, and at some point, you just gotta let bygones be bygones. So I'm I'm from Waterbury, Connecticut. That's my hometown. Isaiah Wright is from Waterbury, Connecticut. So I, if if you've been listening to our pod, I've been pulling for him and kind of dropping his name throughout the uh, the off season training camp. Cam Sims, he's been a camp superstar since his rookie year, but when he gets in the game, either they're not scheming for him, they're not get writing up the plays for him, and I get it. Um, but if he's if he can stay in the practice squad and perhaps work his way up. I think his his body gives us some upside. I mean, you don't find many 6'5 dudes and he's I don't think he's a burner, but he has enough speed where he can still get some separation. Great. I tight. like him I like him on the practice squad, perhaps tight end if he bulks up a little bit. I think I think he's like 220. Um if I if I could get him to about 240, maybe it could be like a Niles Paul. I thought about that as well. Um, but I'm not I'm not crying over you know Cam Sims uh, not making the 53. I think 
it's so I think Dontrell Inman's going to start. I would have rather seen us call up a uh, old hey, Dallas Cowboy dude, all. just because they're both thirty-one. For people listening, know? he threw up the X. <laughs> he yeah. threw up the X. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I, I think the the wide receiver room will be interesting. We know the talent that we have with Terry Mack. Um, everyone else is kind of a question question mark. AGG apparently had a concussion that I heard about today. Um, don't know if he's going to play on Sunday or if he's coming back and recovering or if he suffered a concussion today. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, – Cam Sims is – I think we take a bigger hit in losing Trey Quinn than Cam Sims, if that means oh, anything. Man. Yikes. <laughs> yes, I know. So that, oh. that's my opinion on it. <laughs> Well, on the defensive side of the ball, uh, we released uh, David Bada. I don't I have no idea who he is. Um, defensive end Jordan Brailford. Uh, cornerback Aaron Colvin. Defensive end Nate Orchard. Sad face. Um, linebacker Donald, not Deron Payne. And lastly, safety Jeremy Reeves. Um, I think we can all agree that other than the feel-good story of Orchard, uh, who actually went to the practice law squad alongside a few others, I think Colvin was probably the only one that was a surprise here. Is that fair, Chris? I mean, uh, based on the ones you listed, yeah, but – uh, we do need to talk about Sean Davis as well. I thought he was the biggest surprise. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You beat me to it. I mean, yeah. that's – I mean, $2 million in guarantees. You know, comes over from Pittsburgh, gets a, gets a crap ton of starts over there. Didn't necessarily look good, but, I mean, he's a local kid. He was really excited to be here. You know, Washington media just jumped all over it. And everybody thought he was a shoe in a start. And then Wonder Bread takes a job, man. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I, it's crazy. I definitely had Sean Davis starting this year, even though I – I wasn't all that excited about it. I didn't think he was going to do much, but I thought he, you know, would hold his own enough to where, you know, he could be a suitable uh, player in that lineup until we got someone who, you know, better was suited for that role. But, I mean, Troy Apke supposedly is balling in camp. I I don't know what that means. I don't know if we'll see that on Sunday. Um, I'm definitely a little nervous with Troy Apke back there. But, I mean, I mean, this whole defense is going to be made up on the pass rush. And, uh you know, the front seven. So I think if they can stand their ground, I mean, Troy Apke might be able to just, you know, keep his hands in his pocket the entire game and we'll see how it goes. But yeah, Sean Davis was definitely interesting to bring a guy in who, you know, is almost a shoe and just start and he gets cut. But I mean, besides Troy Apke, I really don't know what we have. Goes I, right back to Pittsburgh too. <laughs> yeah. Dude, did you, did he go back to Pittsburgh? He did. He did. Now, did you just call Apke Wonder Bread? Wonder Bread, correct. That I is love it. I, training camp. <laughs> really? Oh man, yeah. I I hadn't heard that. That's that is hilarious. I got a, a childhood friend we would call Wonder Bread as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, yo. from, I'm enthusiastic about Apke, man. I really wanted to work out. I, I watched too. him play at Penn State, but I hate when people are like Apke has so much upside. Look at this, and all they do is show that interception he got against the Niners in that monsoon game where Jimmy yes. G just threw a duck. Garoppolo from the pocket. Overthrows, and it's intercepted. Troy Apke, who just came in for the injured Monte Nicholson. Oh, my God, that is not a measuring stick, okay? He made it one good play. Apke, my memory of him is is him running in in spandex shorts at the combine, and Deion Sanchez was like, holy He didn't curse, but he's like, whoa. He's like, he's white? This is Troy Apke. Oh, man, he can run. Why are you surprised, Dan? Oh, well, you know why I'm surprised. I can't say it on TV, but he can run, run. <laughs> he was a track guy. Right. He was a track guy. But you but you're saying it with an You don't tone. see that much. You're saying it in tone. Back. Let's call it what it is. I like that, he man. He just ran 4-3-5. Hey, man, I'm going to hug at him. At 215 pounds. I'm going to hug him. <laughs> hey, man, that was good, man. <laughs> You can run, run. Excuse me, 200 pounds. <laughs> I try. How are you, man? Good job. How <laughs> to say your last name? Apke? He ran a blazing, yeah. like, 4-3-4, four, four, something sick. So he has the speed. That's what you – I mean, at free safety, that's that's your center fielder. You need someone with speed. I think Apke's uh, problem is has been Minuski, man. And maybe I'm being overly optimistic. I think that a lot of our team the past couple of seasons were just played out of out of scheme, out of position. Oh, yeah, uh, we've been saying that, too. Absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I think this defense improves just by Minuski being out the building. They never, knew what they, were gonna do. they never knew what they were doing. I mean, look on the field. Landon's like, oh, no, you're supposed to be over there. And Monte's got his hands up. And, you Nuts. know, I mean, every Sunday you saw there was nothing but miscommunication. 
in, in, on that defense, and it was absolutely insane. I mean, yeah. I don't. I, I'm going to put you this way with Troy Apke. You know, something you hear people say often about him is, oh, he takes he takes bad angles. I was like, oh, okay, so he can't tackle. Can you just say that he can't tackle? Because, I mean, we all know the athletic abilities there. You know, you got no, there's no telling what Dion would have said now that he's at Barstool when he saw Apke run that 40. You know, I mean, he's got the athletic ability, but it, it what it really comes down to is, is he bought into this Jack Del Rio defense? I mean, that's really the biggest question. Do you see him having a good year in 2020? What, what do you see coming out of it, Rodney? I do. I, I think he's going to have a huge year. And like, this is, this is me being the blind optimist. Um, but here's the thing, like you just talked about, Chris said, you know, we, we bring in, uh, you know, Sean Davis and we all expect it to be Davis and Collins, Davis and Collins. And right on the onset of training camp, as reports start coming out, they're like, Hey, Apke's lining up with the ones. Apke's performing really well with the ones. Apke's laying the head stick on people. I'm like, well, God like that's something you hadn't heard from him you you knew he had the speed and sometimes you know you have generational talent or just you know all pro talent that they don't need the coaching they don't need the coaching they're going to step on the field and they're going to get the numbers for you sometimes you have someone that's on the cusp of being pretty damn good and can be coached to greatness i think and i'm hopeful that that's troy apke um hopefully that he does have a coach whether it's a positional coach, an actual coordinator that believes in him and is coaching him up and making him look at the entire holistic approach towards, okay, this is the field. This is this is your your view from the free safety box. Here's what we want you to do. Go do it. I, I hope, man. I, I hope that it, it works out for us, man. Um, obviously, we haven't had a real stud at safety no. um, since Sean, man. So um, – I'm not going to say that Apke's going to be Sean Taylor. I think that was one of one. And I think Sean was more of a, a strong safety with a free safety capability um, ball hawk. But, hey, if if, if we could get 50% of Sean and Troy, you know, Apke, I'm, I'm all for it, man. And just we'll see. Imagine if you could give Landon Collins, and you're talking about percentages, if you give Landon Collins Troy Apke speed. I mean, that's like the – the perfect safety. And, you know, I, I'm five six. You know, not exactly the biggest guy in the world. And when I played football, it was all about speed, man. And as long as you knew your assignment, knew where you're supposed to go, you know, knew knew what you were doing, you could make up for that lack of physicality. And I feel like that's really going to be the the big thing with Apke. And I I really respect this coaching staff for really co- sort of putting him on the spot and be like, look, man, this is your chance. I mean, that's kind of the, the overall theme of Rivera and his entire regime here so far. And I, I can't help but respect it. Um, yeah. yeah. Apke's a big dude too, man. He's six one, you know, yeah. two hundred five pounds. So I mean, he, he has the height that you want. Um, just can, can he put it into a full package for sixteen plus games? You know, I, I hope he can. That is the question. Yeah. Um, but we move on from the cuts. The final fifty three that are locked in for the two thousand twenty season, and we'll, we'll get through this uh, unofficial depth chart that was released. Um, one roster spot that had a lot of doubt as to whether he would make the cut or be placed on IR was quarterback Alex Smith, who is two years removed from his tragic injury. Um, Rodney, we all thought Alex would be, you know, a shoe in for the IR, uh, other than maybe Bryce Love, Ruben Foster. Did you see this coming? And did you feel as it was if it was a race, waste of a roster spot? Yes, absolute waste, absolute waste. So, of of the five, uh, you know, commentators I have on my podcast, the only one who believed in Alex Smith making the fifty three. He he said it once he was activated from the pup as um our boy Dev. He was like, hey, Alex Smith will make the fifty three. Um, I think the optics of it, the Washington football team brass didn't want to cut a dude who almost lost his life playing for the Washington Redskins, you know? Um, so I think it's a feel good story. Um, but if you're an organization that's trying to win a Super Bowl, and granted we're three and 13, are we truly in Super Bowl discussion? Probably not, but still you put together what are the best 53 men from your training camp, your draft, et cetera, free agency to help you progress towards a title. I think he took away uh, a roster spot that could have gone to someone else, maybe Cam Sims, who who knows. But um, with Alex, I think the upside of having him on the roster, though, is he's seen the game. He's played at a high enough level um, where he can help Dwayne if he starts to struggle. He's only a second-year quarterback. This is, you know, year 14, I guess. You know, not year 14, but – 12th grade being year 12, 13 being a year of college, and then 14. So this is like 14.7 or something like that for for Haskins. So now having Smith on the roster will help those guys mature, both Allen and Haskins. Um, But I don't have time for feel-good stories. 
I don't want to see him get in the game. Um, he's still wearing this this weird contraption on his leg that I've never seen before. You can still see the distortion in the tissue um, in his leg. Unless it's a ceremonial snap and we're beating the hell out of the Philadelphia Eagles week one, that's the only time I want to see him take a snap. Um, beyond that, release him. Um, and have him medically retire, whatever. But it just seems nuts that you kept him um, when there are still younger guys that could have made the team. Or you could have kept Adrian Peterson. That's a you whole know. way to look at it. And I mean, look, Dwayne Haskins earned the job. You know, he actually became a captain today. And and that's a testament to all the work he's put in the offseason. Yep. You know, but Dwayne isn't the one in question here. We can sit here and gush over him for hours. Everybody knows he's putting the work in, cut the weight, head in the playbook. Everybody's saying nothing but good things about Dwayne. So Dwayne, Dwayne's fine. Anybody thinking that Alex Smith's going to come in and take Haskins' job right now, it's the silliest argument possible. But the reason I ask this, and Chris, I'll start with you. Alex Smith is listed as the third quarterback in the depth chart, Kyle Allen being the number two. With a guy like Allen as a competent backup and a pretty familiar offense, do you feel like this is a waste of a roster spot? No, I, I don't actually. And and the reason I say this is I hope he never sees the field either. Even in a situation where Dwayne would go down, I'd still hope you know Kyle Allen goes in first as a second backup. Um, but I think he makes this roster just for his coachability. Just as Rodney was saying, man, it, his the the asset that he is for this team is being able to stay in Dwayne's pocket and is also a guy who can come in and play if, like, it's just completely necessary. And I, I don't know if Ron Rivera will be that guy to put him in, even if it is necessary. I don't know if they go out and get Mark Sanchez again and bring him in for a game or two, but I, I think Alex Smith is completely last resort. But his ability, <laughs> Rodney's gagging over there when I brought up Mark Sanchez's name. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> No, but just for his coachability, man, for him to be there on the field, be a, you know, uh, another quarterback's coach for Dwayne, like Rodney said, ha he's seen the game. He he's picked up this system very, very quick. He's picked up Scott Turner's system system very, very quick. He can be in Dwayne's ear constantly throughout the season, be on the sideline with him, you know, talk over plays with him on the but bench. Does he I think have just for that reason to do that. I mean, he needs to be there on game day. He was there all pretty much, you know, all last season. I feel like he could have been there in a capacity to help out Haskins even without being on the active roster. And, I mean, like, like Ronnie said, you know, I mean, you're taking AP's roster spot. You're taking Cam Sims' roster spot. And like you said, if, if we get really slim at running back and Adrian Peterson's balling in Detroit, you're going to feel some type of way about that when you see Alex Smith walking around the sideline. You don't think that's a fair argument? I think, I, th I think it's fair, but I think that if they really wanted Adrian Peterson in Washington, they would have cut someone else. There's plenty of other guys to cut to keep Adrian Peterson on the team. Well, you got Bryce Love, you got Reuben Foster. I mean, you think that, but we've got so many like delicate situations, you know. Um, I, def I definitely agree. Peyton Barber, Peyton Barber could have gotten cut to Foster. keep Adrian Peterson on. Clearly, Barber's a Rivera guy, okay? And, and like you, guy. you just said Foster. Like, the, and here, here's my my aggravation with them keeping Alex Smith, you know, on the roster. He was on pup. He couldn't perform. So was Reuben Foster. Now Ruben Foster's on the IR. Exactly. You could have you could have kept them on pup, but inversely, with Chris is saying, you know, you you do have a smart quarterback in the room, and I think one thing we're potentially not talking about: the third string quarterback typically runs the scout team offense in 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 practice. So that is exceptional because there are 32 other teams or 31 other teams that do not have a quarterback, the caliber of Alex Smith running that scout team offense versus the defense. So if you're talking about keeping potentially at least keeping that defense honest and, and sharpened, I think we got the best, the best uh, scout QB in the league without a doubt, because he has the mental acuity to place the ball where it needs to be placed and keep them honest. Now, granted, they're going to be going against two and three, so they should have the advantage. Um, but that'll be an interesting storyline to perhaps pay attention to just to see how he's performing, you know, uh, weekly throughout the practices as a scout QB. I think the pup situation was honestly the best case scenario. You activate him after week eight. If you need him in any capacity, he's there. And, you know, even with him being on the pup, correct me if I'm wrong, he's still allowed to be involved in team relations, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, I mean, like, you still get that coaching aspect. He can still be in Dwayne's ear. He can still be in Kyle Allen's ear. Because Kyle Allen's also a second-year quarterback who could really use Alex Smith's wisdom. Don't forget about Kyle Allen and all this. I mean, he's not going to come in and burn the world down, but he was a very competent starter in Carolina last year, especially when things got ugly. So, but you're talking about AP. Um, speaking of him, um, Antonio Gibson 
was a shoe in to be taking RB1 from him. But uh, the unofficial depth chart says not so fast. Um, J.D. McKissick not only made the 53-man roster, but is also listed as the starting running back for the Washington football team. Um, Rodney, I'll start with you. Do you feel like this is smoke and mirrors so that you know they get sort of a competitive advantage going into Sunday? Or, I mean, the job's clearly Gibson's, right? Yeah, it better be Gibson's. It's disgusting that he's listed as running back one as far as McKissick goes. So once again, I'm I'm sort of a, a stats dude as well. Uh, average 3.55 yards per rush over his career. 88 attempts, 402 yards rushing. You know, 70 receptions, 515 yards. So we know he's more of a – well, he really does both. But, dude, it's disgusting that he's listed as RB1 knowing who we got rid of. Knowing That's who we a released. guy that we were talking about cutting. Weeks yes. ago, a guy yes. that some people didn't think was making the 53, and now he's RB1. And that's like, what that's what pisses me off when people talk about, hey, we're going to have a two running back set. Who the hell is scared of that? <laughs> Who's scared <laughs> of J.D. McKissick? That's what I'm saying. Like, no one is – no one's game planning for that. You have to game plan for Adrian Peterson, even at his advanced age – in the NFL, you have to game plan for AD. You don't have to game plan for JD McKissick. And that's that's the rub. So I hope that it is smoke and mirrors. I hope that they're only gonna be okay, McKissick's gonna be RB1. Let's look at his, you know, his NFL tape, which is crickets, instead of looking at, you know, Gibson's college tape. Um, which I mean he doesn't have a lot of rushes either, but he's more dynamic with the ball than McKissick is. And he has a hell of a lot more, you know, sturdy frame in him as well. So, yeah, hope it's smoke and mirrors. If if he's getting 30 yards or 30 yards, if he's getting 30 rushes, 25 rushes week one, he better be lighting it up. Uh, beyond that, like, I I cannot live with him being the starting running back the entire season. I just can't do it. Especially if you're letting a guy like AP walk, man. I mean, yes. even at this point in AP's career, I mean, there were plays where you could just see – you know, just the IQ that he accumulated over the years. There's some of the cuts he made. Like, he knew what was going on in the field at all times. You know, I mean, he was very well tenured. You know, I, I mean, he's just there, – there's certain things about Adrian Pearson that you just can't replace, and there's nobody in this running back core other than Antonio Gibson, in my opinion, that's irreplaceable. I mean, I saw J.D. McKissick play in Detroit. I saw J.D. McKissick play in Seattle. I mean, you got Matthew Stafford and Russell Wilson. Now you're going into a situation with a second-year quarterback, a brand-new offensive coordinator. It's not ideal, and you're trying to tell me that I need to fear J.D. McKissick as if he were a Alvin Kamara type. I need to be worried about that. I mean, him and Antonio Gibson were both former receivers in college. So, I mean, I see what they're going for there. They have a lot of those two-back sets where, you know, you really don't know what any of them do out of the backfield. And if you watch training camp, you know, you're going to see a lot of J.D. catching stuff out of the backfield. You know J.D.'s role in this offense. Like I told Mitch last week, he's pretty much the new Chris Thompson. And, and it's so obvious what Rivera is trying to do with Antonio Gibson. He's trying to keep it a secret even though we all know what's going on. So, Chris, do you think this is smoke and mirrors for a job that is clearly Gibson's? It's got to be. I don't, I don't understand. You know, at the beginning of this off season, and and just after the draft, you were looking at Geis, AP, and Gibson as as your tandem, and you could have picked from any one of those guys. You know, uh, that was out of the hands of the organization. He left because of the decisions he made, and um, Adrian Peterson was the organization's decision. And now you have Gibson. You know, this year up and comer is supposed to get all the reps. He's supposed to prove himself. He's supposed to be the new, you know, running back face of the running back position in DC. And you put JD McKissick as the number one running back. That just makes no sense to me, man. I mean, like you said, you beat me to it. McKissick was, when he was signed, he was Chris Thompson's replacement. You know that, I mean, At I best. remember people, people were, people were waving goodbye to Chris Thompson as we signed McKissick because they knew that was his role. He was a third down back, if that. And then we, you know, drafted Gibson and then, oh, maybe he's the third down running back. McKissick had no role in this offense and now he's running back one. I mean, I feel like, you know, I think our front seven is by far our strongest position group, but our running back, we were locked and loaded at running back at the beginning of this offseason, and now J.D. McKissick is our starter going into week one. It's insane. And and I don't know, maybe it is some sort of strategy where, you know, they're saying Philly has to prepare for J.D. McKissick. But as Rodney said, what do you prepare for? He's just any other, you know, random running back. He, he's, there's, there's no game planning for it. And, man, I just – if if McKissick comes out there to, you know, to uh, take the first handoff – against Philly, I'm going to lose it. I mean, I'm sure I'll be texting you, Parker. That's just – it's insane to think that Gibson won't be in there to start, man. It's just well, – I, I don't I got to ask you this. Rivera says he confirmed today that it's going to be a committee, obviously. But, of course, I ask this. How do you see Bryce Love fitting in all this? I mean, he's looked great in camp as of late. You know, it was kind of rough early because he was trying to get acclimated back to playing football again after almost two, see, two years. I mean, are you at the point where you can trust him now? I mean, honestly, I was surprised he didn't go to IR. 
That was another guy who I didn't think was going to make the cut. Yeah, I have high hopes for Bryce Love, man. And I feel like, you know, we, we've seen him practice and we've seen him taking snaps with the ones on 11 on 11 and everything. So I don't know why he's not more in this conversation either. I, I almost feel like they're going to start him off with like a, a minutes restriction like you'd see in the NBA where he's just going to come in a little bit, see how it feels, maybe get hit that first time, get his first pop and and uh, just see how it feels, see how it goes and everything. I feel like Bryce Love is going to climb up the depth chart throughout the season. Um, I guess they're just a little um, hesitant right now to stick him in there, coming off the injury and coming off of you know two years without football, even though he does look to be completely healthy. Rodney, what's your what is your stock in Bryce Love? You feel like he's going to work his way into this committee? You feel like he could end up taking the starting role? He he's my starting running back in Madden. Amen. <laughs> I, just, I was doing the same thing. Thirty five. He's fast hundred. as hell, man. He's fast they got to do hell. something he, about thirty five. They got to yeah. do something. 35. Yeah, he he got injured um for me unfortunately like week eleven, but uh I won the Super Bowl. I went sixteen and one. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that's how I do it. But uh, I play an all pro. I can't do all man anymore. I'm too old for that shit. I'm thirty eight, man. I'm thirty eight, man. I don't got time for that shit. I'll be breaking controllers. I play on the computer. I'll, this thing costs oh, too damn no. much. I'll probably it smash it. So yeah, I can't I can't do it. So no, nah. <laughs> I think love. I think he has so. Me being the optimist and, you know, kind of, oh, I hope this is what happens. He went to the same university of Christian McCaffrey. He, you know, he, he played with him at Stanford, uh, had pretty much Heisman-like seasons following him, uh, and then had the ACL tear um, before again drafted by us. Now, it's naive to say that he's going to be Christian McCaffrey's clone in the NFL. What Christian McCaffrey has done has been phenomenal um, as a player. But that's the, that's the hopeful fans. Like, holy shit. Like, hope do we? Do we have his potential clone? I think their body types are a little bit different. I think Love's a little bit smaller, uh, not as uh, muscular as McCaffrey. Um, but I think he will work his way up the depth chart. Now, he's listed as fourth right now. I don't see him being the fourth running back uh, yeah. throughout the entire season. I think eventually he has to dethrone uh, J.D. McKissick, and it may be more Love in Gibson. I hate um, that's how it's worded. Has to it's, dethrone J.D. McKissick. That's crazy, right? I know, my God, it's disgusting. I have to use soap Awful. in my mouth later on. It's, it's horrible to even say that. But a question for you guys. What's the over-under on us running some sort of three running back wishbone set? Uh, honestly? Shit, that's what we ran in high school, Parker. That's yeah, what I'm saying. That, that, that would be... Did. How dope would that be, though? Like, if you're talking about mismatches, so typically you have two running backs and a fullback in the wishbone. Um, but what if you go with three speedy dudes back there? Are we you, running? Are we running the triple option now? Is this is this Georgia it? Tech? No, I have Turner no idea, man. But hey, up his sleeve. Turner hey, has something up his sleeve. It would be fun to watch. I'll tell you this: triple option is not fun to play defense against. I don't. No, I don't talking, yeah, go ahead. They're talking about Turner. You know, using Gibson as sort of the Curtis Samuel of the offense. Him being you know, the motion man, I, you can't help but think that they're, they're being so secret about all this because they have a lot, they have a lot of pretty ambitious plans for this running back committee. They, they have to. And I don't think wishbones out of the question. They're going to do some crazy stuff. I definitely agree with that. That would be dope, man. Just <laughs> yeah. the, dude, the, this, the, the mismatches that you can create with that, like, Oh my God. So now granted, we need some strong tight ends as well. So it may not be perfect, but you, you won't even have a, a dime defensive package that would be able to, keep up with that sort of speed and potential power. I think Gibson has some power and push behind him. Um, I'm not sure if Love does or either McKissick, but uh, that that would be exciting to see, man, just to switch it up, do something new because we've been stagnant. We've been a doorstop uh, floor mat for too far too long. So I'm run, hoping run that pass. we can something. Yeah. Now, run, we, run, have, run. we have seen plays uh, in practice. I don't know if you guys have seen the clip where – Dwayne is running the speed option with Antonio Gibson. So, I mean, they're going to oh, get no. creative. I mean, we've seen, we saw the speed option last year with Dwayne and AP, but I think they're, I think we saw it twice, maybe twice. I don't even know who's against, Dwayne, but Dwayne's down 20 pounds now too. I mean, he can actually run the ball. Yeah. I mean, he, he showed he had the instinct last year and, and obviously this coaching staff told him to slim down. They've got some of those concepts playing for him. I mean, if you watched Carolina late in the season last year, when Scott Turner was the offensive coordinator, you saw a lot of that. And I mean, and some of the concepts that you guys are referring to, Kevin O'Connell kind of incorporated some of them at the end of last year with, with, with Steven Sims and a couple other players. So I, I think that they have the weaponry to, to make some stuff like that happen for sure. Um, but we go from running back to wide receiver. Um, Ron also revealed today that the reason that we have not been seeing Antonio Gandy Golden is due to the fact that he's currently suffering a concussion. 
In the team's unofficial depth chart, AGD is slated as the team's number two wide receiver. Only Steven Sims and Dontrell Emmon trailing him. I don't exactly remember what order that they are in. Um, the Washington football team only has five wide receivers on the active roster. Um, fun fact, three of them being undrafted players. Um, Rodney, do you feel like the team's in dire need of some veteran talent, especially with AGG out? Or do you feel like Dontrell Emmons' chemistry he's building with Haskins is adequate enough to keep us afloat? I think I think the chemistry he's building will be adequate enough, but I was expecting after the final 53 – um, to pick up someone else on free agency, you know, or off the waiver wire rather. Um, but yeah, I, I hope AGG can bounce back. I, I think we would need him to. Now he hasn't had the best camp. Um, we've heard about his football IQ and the Rubik's cube. We, you know, he's Drops. a likable guy, um, but yeah, he's been dropping the ball. Um, hasn't been running clean routes. And that's, I mean, it's a rookie. It's, it's COVID season, you know, so I, I understand. And I emphasize with that. I expect the first couple of weeks of football to be sloppy preseason type level of football um, anyway, until these guys get their footing. So I'm not overly concerned with his, his play or, you know, or lack of good play thus far. Um, but I, I think that will be okay. I, I, I think that the, the rapport already existed between uh, Haskins and McLaurin and hearing that, you know, Inman could come in, you know, eight year wide receiver, 31 years old. He has enough, football intelligence and capability to be a decent, you know, um, you know, receiver opposite of McLaurin. I'm not sure if I'll label him as a threat, but I think he'll be a decent, you know, wide receiver number two for us. I think I was listening to uh, you guys actually. And I think when you guys compared him to maybe Jabbar Gaffney, there was another veteran wide receiver that you guys compared him to. And I think that's all you need him to be. That guy can get you 10, 15 yards and, you know, just be a reliable option for Haskins. You know, you got Terry, you already got your undisputed number one. You got Sims in the slot. All you really need is somebody that can be what Kelvin Harden was supposed to be this year and be that second option for Haskins and kind of get those intermediate routes. Yeah. Um, Chris, is there a veteran out there that you think that they should bring in to maybe fill the void, or do you feel like they're good or good enough to keep them afloat as of right now? I, I think it might be good enough to keep afloat, but I definitely want to get another wide receiver in there. And I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, Cam Sims is still in the practice squad, right? Correct. Is that okay? So. So I think he's a guy we can come back to if needed. Um, I think AGG is definitely a guy who I think we all have high expectations of this year. But I think we all are under the understanding that he did come from a small school. There's no preseason. It is, you know, COVID. No matter how much we love him. <laughs> Yeah. All this going on and on. He's not going to be perfect coming out. And I don't think you're going to see the AGG this year that we're hoping for. That's not saying that he won't become that. And I think he will. I think, you know middle of this season, if, if he stays healthy, we'll see the AGG that we need him to be. Um, so I'm not too upset that, that uh, he's struggling in camp. I think that was expected along with everyone else. Um, I think if you are succeeding in camp this year, you're, you're saying a lot. So, um, no, I think it was kind of expected. The concussion really sucks. I think, you know, having uh, kind of an injury report this early in his career is, is kind of scary a little bit, but concussion, one concussion, is it might just happen to everyone. So we'll see how that plays out. But, um I can't tell you a specific receiver they should go target right now, but I think we definitely need to have some people in our back pocket for sure. Uh, Cam Sims being one of them to look at off the practice squad, and and, and I wouldn't even uh, be against them going out and looking to some other guys too. I think Wonder Bread needs to stop stacking bodies in, in training camp, man. I was I was going to ask, was Apke the one who injured him? Do we know? That's what I'm hearing. I, I don't have any any confirmation yeah. of that, but that, that is the overall consensus so far. He, I mean, he plus, at least is listed as a full participant in practice today, too, though. So that's that's good news. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, maybe maybe we don't have him week one, but I definitely think we'll have him week two in Arizona for sure. Um, as far as bringing in a possible – veteran wide receiver. I, I'm personally a big Inman guy. I watched him in uh when he played for San Diego. Um watched him when he played for the Colts. I, I mean he's got a pretty pretty decent resume. He's always been somebody that, that the quarterback finds. Maybe not in ideal situations, but like I said, he 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 he's good for those intermediate routes, 10, 15 yards. He's somebody you can rely on. He's exactly what you thought you were gonna have with Kelvin Harmon. And I feel like he can hold you over until AGG comes back from a concussion. I mean it's not a significant injury. He'll be out for maybe a week or two. It sucks. Um but I think Emmett can keep us afloat. Um, Ronnie, how do you feel about a possible Muhammad Sanu Dwayne Haskins reunion? I we were we were up on that man. So one of the other hosts, man, Le, he was he was all about Sanu a couple months ago, saying, "Hey, well, you know what's up with this reunion? You know, seeing them the off season practicing and whatnot." Um, but the reports out of New England is that he was just slow and lacked burst and separation. So hearing that, I'm like, ah, you know what? I don't think we have yeah. a, a spot for him on our roster just because. Um, 
if if you're not going to succeed in New England's vanilla ass offense, um, <laughs> we're saying that Scott Turner is going to be pretty dynamic, and he wants to you know stretch the field. If you have someone that's slow and can't create separation, then unfortunately you don't have a home for us in DC. So yeah, I, I think uh, we'll stay away from Sanu. I'm Antonio really Brown, though. Antonio, right. Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown. What's up with him? No. Go after that crazy <laughs> bastard, man. Why not? No. That was oh, cool man. a few months ago, man. Bro, he twerked on us, and I hated him since he twerked on us in that damn end zone. But <laughs> shit, if he comes and plays for us, I'll love you again. So yeah, okay, Look, man, I'll, I'll get off that. I'll get off that hype train. <laughs> he's, a, he's a head case, but I would lose my mind if we signed him. He's just. He's the epitome of like an anti Rivera guy, though. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, he is. So I know. Isaiah Wright, you know, shout out for that, man. I mean, that you know, undrafted free agent, but, I mean, he's had a really good camp. You know, speedster, you know, built the team since early this year. I feel like he's a guy that could really benefit from AGG possibly not being on the field. Um, as far as the rest of the wide receiving core, Steven Sims, of course, will take over the special duties after uh, Jay Gruden's son went to Jacksonville. Um, let's go ahead and <laughs> let's go move to our next position group, tight end. Um, Chris, how do you feel about the three that made the roster? Um, how do you think they're going to fit in Scott Turner's offense? Also, I need you to ground yourself for a second because, you know, I know I know you're a hokey. You know, there's a Logan Thomas hype. You know, it's been real this offseason. Do you buy him as tight end one? Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> man. I'm telling you, Logan, and this is completely unbiased. This is just because I have seen him play. And 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 I can't speak. And, okay. At quarterback. You know, you exactly. That's what I was going to say. You know I'm not being biased. Because I watched him play at Tech as a quarterback. So I'm I'm strictly, you know, vouching for him on his tight end ability. He's a big effing dude. He catches the ball. Now, I'm not saying he is, like, the most versatile tight end. He's no Gronk. He's no Kittle. But I think he's going to surprise a lot of people this year. I know Scott Turner is not big into the tight end. I know that um, Logan Thomas is not much of a tight end. But I think I think he's definitely the best tight end option for us i still think our tight end group is very very weak and i think in a uh on a good team logan thomas might be uh tight end three tight end two i don't think he'd be a starter but for us i think he's a pretty viable option um jeremy sprinkle i i don't even know man i <laughs> i mean i think everyone knows how we feel about jeremy sprinkle i don't think he's his sound is ever going to really come to fruition he's a huge dude but we we've seen him drop so many passes we've seen him make just horrible, horrible plays. I don't I don't even know what to say about Jeremy Sprinkle. I don't understand how he's still on this team. Um, Marcus Ball, I'm kind of excited for. Um, I haven't seen him play. I don't necessarily want to fall into the hype that, you know, the media is creating. But hype at the tight end position is something I did not think we would get out of camp. So it is exciting. As, you don't feel as if they're creating that hype for Logan Thompson in a way? I mean, he, he's doing well, great at training camp. They are. I mean, I think he and Dwayne have created a chemistry for sure, but I kind of already, you know, had my eyes on Logan Thomas from the get-go from the minute we signed him. I mean, I, th I think you know that more than anybody, but we, we that need more. That could have been QB3. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's got to be the emergency quarterback. He has to be the emergency quarterback, man. So, yeah, it's. I think if, if I could just jump in the, uh, the the double dutch, I think that Logan Thomas is kind of unexpected for me, but it's 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 cool to see someone go through such a – you know, a, a huge position change um, from quarterback to tight end and then be tight end number one. He just has to hold on to the ball. Though. The only thing I didn't like from him during camp, you heard of a lot of fumbling issues uh, with him. Now, what do you guys know anything about his blocking ability? Is he kind of short? Oh, do that? I know anything about his blocking ability? <laughs> Is it good or bad? I know anything about his blocking ability. Ask oh Brian God. Kerrigan. I was at the Detroit Lions game, and Kerrigan got just dismantled. <laughs> Really? Dismantled by Logan Thomas. Well, this is what you generally call split zone. So you're going to run zone one way, and the motion man is going to come across the formation, Thomas there, and pick off the end guy of the line of scrimmage. And Brian Kerrigan just got drilled. Seems to be all right, but that was quite a hit right into his chest. I actually put a video up on the page. You can find it after we stop recording. Yeah. And he absolutely pops him. You hear it? It's like his helmet breaks or something. Logan's a big guy, man. He's got that physicality. Yeah. You know, I was in a couple tech games. You know, I'm not it's not my alma mater like Chris, but I went to a couple games, man, and, and he looked he looked fantastic. And you know, I mean, a, as an athlete, personally, I feel like if he's anywhere other than Washington, we're not talking about him at all. I told Chris to stay grounded. Um, I don't know why I expected that, but <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be I'm wrong. Telling you, man. 
he's not he's not going to you know take the league over by storm. He's not going to be our leader in receptions or touchdowns or anything like that. But he is going to be a viable option at tight end. You're going to see him make plays. You're going to see him get first downs. You're going to see a hell of a lot of people try to tackle him and not be able to. I'm telling you that right now. He might drop some balls. He might. Roddy makes a great point. The ball security is an issue, and it was yeah. an issue throughout camp. Holy shit. I'm sorry. As you're talking to me about this this block by Logan Thomas, I went to YouTube to pick it <laughs> up. He bent his face I, mask. I told you. I, dude, I was there live. We ended up getting really good seats. It was like 100 Damn. Points. He killed him. I was like, I've never seen in all my years Ryan Kerrigan get hit like that. So – I, I immediately bought Logan Thomas as a blocking tight end that day. I don't question it. I think in the trenches he brings value. But when people are talking about him like he's the next George Kittle, it just kind of cracks me up. You know, you're gonna see Washington. You know, writers. I have never writers. said he's the next I never George. Said you did. Kittle. I never said you, you did. Me. You're you're shouting me. You're you're coming at me though because there's no one else talking about Logan Thomas like I am. That's debatable. That's, that's debatable, awesome, you know? man. I love this right now though. I'm smiling ear to ear, man. Holy hell, that's yeah, awesome. I, yeah, I said it. We saw on the pod a couple weeks back that you know he brings a lot as a blocker, and in that game, mind you, it's the injury depleted Detroit Lions versus the three and thirteen. Washington football team, Logan Thomas made some plays. And, and I feel like he he can make a play here and there. But I still cannot rest knowing that we have finally have a tight end. And I, I just you got guys like Delaney Walker sitting out there, man, that you can just go pick up. I mean, what are you hurting, you know? But this has been a very, you know, risky type of approach with this coaching staff. So it really doesn't surprise me too much. I hope Chris Bruce is wrong. I hope I look stupid, uh, quite frankly. I hope Logan Thomas balls out. So We definitely need another option, though. And, and I hope it's Marcus Ball. I hope he comes up to be our future tight end. I mean, if, if I'm being completely honest, I kind of hope Logan Thomas is not our tight end of the future. I hope he's not playing, you know, two to three years down the road for us. And if he is, I hope he's tight end three at the best. I, I think there are much better options out there. And I think that we do need to address that position group and get better there. But I think as of this season, out of this roster right now, I think Logan Thomas is going to be okay. You know, and, and then you got Richard Rodgers, who went straight back to Philadelphia to tell him our entire game plan. What a traitor, man. God. I know. We were calling him a punk bitch on our pod earlier, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's such a dirty move. His hands on the coach's oh. staff, too. Like, oh sorry, my man, gosh. I got you it's best for business. He's better pissing his potatoes, man. Richard Rodgers wouldn't have an NFL career if Aaron Rodgers didn't close his eyes and throw up a 60-yard bomb. So, <laughs> um, But lastly, we have the offensive line. Um, a group we focused on last week in our hog hierarchy with Mitch Tischler, uh, a group I think that warrants the most concern. Um, protecting Dwayne Haskins this season, and I hate to say this, will be left tackle Jerron Christian, left guard Wes Martin, center Chase Ruye, right guard Brandon Scherf, and right tackle Morgan Moses. I think there are going to be some rotational guys in there like Keith Ismiel and Wes Schweitzer, of course. Um, but there's just so much uncertainty in the position, man. We know Sheriff and Moses are going to hold down the right. But Rodney, how much does offense, the state of the offensive line worry you? And is it safe to say that this is the weakest position group after cuts? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone uh, did not expect Deron Christian uh, to start. Um, we thought it was going to be Cornelius Lucas, um, honestly. Now, he hasn't had the, the greatest career either, but he's a mountain of a man. The dude's huge. Um, you thought that he had he had a pretty good season last year. I think highest it was the Lions. Chicago, yeah, highest rated Washington. season. So, like, he was he was, he was was uh, – he performed admirably. I'm like, okay, you know, he'll he'll come in and have a spot starter this year, and we'll move on. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, it's been it's been nice to see Dwayne have quick releases in practice because I think he's going to need it. Uh, <laughs> because if you hold on to the ball too long, you're going to get smacked up, man. Uh, yeah, the entire left side of the line uh, bears no confidence for me whatsoever, and that's why it's it's huge. If you guys say Logan Thomas can block, um, you'll have to at least put him in motion or line him up on the weak side and, uh, you know, or at least, you know, the blind side of the quarterback and let him uh, be an additional blocker over there. But yeah, I'm not looking forward to drawing Christian. Who, who knows? Maybe he surprises us. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty hurt that Sadiq Charles didn't take over, um, you know, and, and earn that spot. But I think he's been injured and keep the th- the recur- reoccurring theme is that COVID COVID COVID. So uh, um, I don't think Christian will start the entire year. Hopefully he does because that means he's having a great year or a, a pretty damn good year. Uh, if if, if uh, he loses the job, I fully expect Sadiq Charles to uh, take it and keep it. So that's, fingers crossed, hopeful. The one issue there is Sadiq hasn't dressed out one day of camp, has he? He just I jogs mean, around. Like, yeah, he's done nothing. 
he was in my head like the first week or so, and now we see him with a big leg wrap, but well, he's still not ever dressed out. Him, but really, he has a body of work there. Wow. Yeah, he he hasn't he hasn't dressed out at all yet. So, I mean, I, I kind of have high hopes for Sadiq Charles. I think a lot of the reason he fell in the draft was because of his, you know, discipline issues, his you know behavioral issues and stuff like that off the field. Uh, so I kind of you know was expecting him Ron Rivera to whip him into shape and have him ready to go as a really solid left tackle. But I think you know after this, not touching the field in camp is, is very concerning and and definitely leaves a lot of question marks at left tackle. But I'll tell you this. Over or under, how many bootleg rights do we see in uh, week one versus Philly? I'm glad you said week one and not just the entire season because I think week one is going to be all over the place. They're they're going to try their best to protect Dwayne's backside as, as best as they can. I mean, Sadiq Charles, you know, I, I, I just don't think we have a body of work to look at there, and I think that he just had too many issues in college. Yes, he played for the national championship LSU Tigers, and he protected Joe Burrow. That's all great and well. But at the end of the day, man, we need somebody in there right now. And all this does is solidify the fact that we need to be looking at left tackles in the draft next year. And, and, I, and you know, we had Mitch Tischler come on the show last week and say, you know, uh, <laughs> Jerron Christian is the Eric Flowers of this upcoming season. Do you guys agree with that statement? I know me and Chris thought it was a little bullish. Did you think, do you think it's bullish, Rodney? I hope he's right. It's probably so bullish. I. Um, I hope he's right, though, because, like I said, that, that means that he's, he's done enough to be serviceable and Dwayne's not getting smacked around. So I don't want him to be replaced because I want him to perform well. Um, but Sadiq Charles at least is practicing. He had limited participation today. Um, so I'm not sure if this is day one for him. But, yeah, it's just uh, – yeah, ho- hopefully Mitch is right then, man, uh, because I do not want to see our hopeful franchise quarterback get smacked around. I do not want to be a featured guest on the pod sometime in January with, you know – uh, a fifth of bourbon in my damn palm, drinking on the, the video pod saying, you know, we sucked again, boys. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Maybe I, next year. Yeah. How shit we suck again? Yeah, I, I don't want to do that. So, yeah, ho- hopefully it works out, man. <laughs> we go from the offensive line to the defensive line. Um, arr, no surprise arr. there. Um, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, Tim Settle, Matthew Ioannidis. You know, I think everybody saw that coming. What was surprising to me, and I had to bring this up, was James Smith Williams making the roster. Did that take you off? Did that take you off guard at all, Rodney? I mean, coming out of the NC State, we knew he was a high character guy, but due to the draft capital on that side of the ball, especially in that position group, I don't think anybody really saw him having much of a chance. I think it's just coaches' arrogance as far as hey, these are my guys that you know I I brought to the team. This is who I think is going to do well. Um, I think we have a lot of depth uh, with that, you know, position group. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can never have enough depth. But a seventh rounder, that's someone who's kind of a, a dark horse. Um, his his body type is very Kerrigan-esque. Skill set, obviously not uh, not Kerrigan, um, which, is, which is fine. That's a first rounder compared to a, a seventh rounder. Um, but I think it's someone that, He's probably shown enough in camp to warrant making the 53 vice placing him onto the uh, the practice uh, practice roster. I mean, to me, he's Adonis Alexander with his hand in the dirt. That that's what I see when I look at James Williams. I mean, he looks the part, man. He looks. Don't disrespect a hokey like that, man. <laughs> I mean, he, he looks the part, man. He just does. I, and I can't blame the coaching staff for you know like, oh yeah, we can turn that guy into something. Um. But also another surprise, Ryan Anderson was listed as a defensive end rather than a linebacker for the first time. Chris, do you feel like schematically that was for the best? Yeah, absolutely. I think Ryan Anderson came out of Alabama as a defensive end. I think he would have fit better as a defensive end this entire time. But with the 3-4, they just felt he was better at linebacker. I don't know if he'll see the field very much as a defensive end. I don't think he'll have any production as a defensive end. I mean, you got to think Sweat, Kerrigan, and uh, Chase Young – I don't see uh, Ryan Anderson making that huge of an impact at the end, but um, if he's going to make the team, if he's going to, you know, be, be a second stringer, I think defensive end is where he belongs for sure. Hey, where, where do you guys think Chase Young's going to line up? <laughs> right, right or left defensive end? Is it like um, is he going to go against the left tackle or is he going to go against the right tackle? Depth, chart, think... depth, depth chart wise, he's listed as uh, the starter ahead of Kerrigan, so I'm assuming they're going to keep him as a left defensive end going against the right tackle. I would assume that they would have Kerrigan on Lane Johnson and then have Chase on 
ancient dinosaur Jason Peters this weekend. I feel like that's the most favorable matchup. I, I hope so, but then you're saying that Kerrigan's going to start over Montez Sweat. Oh, that's see, but that goes back into this this head coaching. You know, <laughs> they rotate, rotate, rotate. They said that they've yes. got packages for everybody, so we really don't know what they're going to do until Sunday. And I think that's why we're so eager. You know, um, yes. I know we saw last year that Montez when when Kerrigan got hurt and was out for the rest of the season, Montez filled in at Kerrigan's position and did much better. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that's but, what I want him to stay. Very strong end. But stay. That's where I want him to stay, though. Yeah. I'd rather him be the. I'd rather the speed rusher. I think. I think Sweat is more a pure speed guy. Vice Chase being a freak of nature that could speed and bull rush you. Um, so I'd rather have Chase, like you said, beat up on Jason Peters, the old dinosaur, the left tackle, um, and be the blindside threat. And then, if, if anything, if 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 the quarterback is looking, you can see obviously straight ahead of you that the right, you know, defensive end or left defensive end rather is coming towards you. You're going to try to bail in and you're going to have 265 pounds of pure pandemonium coming at you and crush you. That's, that's the hope and dreams I have. So it's interesting, man. I'm going to be Frank. I I feel like you, you let Ryan Kerrigan come in, you let him break the record. And then about week four, cut him. you pick up your phone and you say, (laughs) Hey, Hey, uh, John Elway. uh, There you go. I saw that uh, Von Miller's <laughs> after the year, man. You, you need a pass rusher. You know, Kerrigan's ran his course here. We got a guy in Montez Sweat that, you know, is more than ideal. Definitely a guy we see, you know, starting here for the next decade, you know, maybe a third round pick and, and you ship Kerrigan out. I feel like Kerrigan just doesn't have a place. You, th- you think defense. he would get a third round pick? Yeah, I, was about to say, I don't think, I don't think Kerrigan is going to. I don't know, man. If, if they need him enough. It. Okay. Ima- imagine, imagine um, Denver gets off to a really hot start, which is completely. Completely possible. They got Noah Font, Drew Locke, Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay. I can see your name, all the Pro Bowl talent, Jerry Judy that they have on their roster right now. And then on defense, you lose a guy like Von Miller, you know, a veteran. Ron Kerrigan, you could plug and play him in there immediately, and he would immediately bring that leadership right back to the team. I mean, you got Bradley Chubb who's coming off of a, a off of a season into injury last year. You know, you don't know what you're getting out of him, really. So, I mean, I don't know, man. I, I thought we should have traded Kerrigan last year to Indy and Baltimore when they were calling. So, just, just a thought. Just a thought. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I like it because I think we have the future defensive end on our team now, and I think Kerrigan has proven over the last few seasons, even though he's definitely a fan favorite, he's definitely at the end of his career and it's not giving us the production we're used to from Kerrigan. I think Montez and Chase are definitely going to make up for that times 10. But I think you're being a little bullish with the third rounder. I think we might be able to get something in return. It depends I, on how desperate they are. It just depends. Very true. We get I, a I third know. rounder, man. I'm happily married. I'll kiss you on the cheek at least. I will be ecstatic if that happens, man. (laughs) Let's go. Hey, as soon as I saw that injury to Vaughn last night, I started going nuts in the admin chat, man. I was like, hey, get rid of Kerrigan, trade him. Um, It's 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 weird. Like, I have a I have a love hate relationship with the guy though. Most of the times, I hate him, um, and then I love him in spurts because I that's how Kerrigan has always showed up for me. Um, I think that you would game plan for him, but not as much as like a Vaughn Miller. Um, so that's, and that, and that's what always pissed me off about him going against the quote unquote inferior offensive tackle week in, week out. And there's so many times, you know, I'm not sure if you guys share this broadcast, but you'll see Kerrigan one hand up and he's getting held, Hooked oh, every he's time. Yep. but he's every never time. learned another move. He's never, never learned true. another move. And that Absolutely. is, it has pissed me off about Ryan Kerrigan. Um, I want him to get the record. I think he's a great red skin. I mean, I, I was wearing his, him. I was wearing his, I have his Jersey, you know, don't people probably listen to me like Rod is an asshole. He hates Ryan Kerrigan. I don't, I hate that he turned into the white Brian Arakbo for me. Exactly. As far as even, even Arakbo would do the same thing. He would throw his hands up and look for a flag. Dude, this isn't the NBA. Learn some new skills, learn some pass rush moves and, not look for a flag every play. They're not going to give it to you. Not only that, but he works his way 10 yards downfield behind the quarterback to where if it's a run play, that's a gaping hole. He's and if it's out. a pass play, they, they, they you know, jump up in the pocket to where he's completely passed. I mean, he's free. He's rush free. Yep. You, you want me to be bullish? I'm going to keep being bullish. In a it. decade, Chase Young's production is going to make you say, Ryan Kerrigan who? I, I, I mean, so. come on. I mean, Chase Young is the prototypical defensive end in the National Football League. Ryan Kerrigan has done a lot of things for this organization on and off the field, but that run is at its end. If you can gracefully let AP walk, what is stopping you from doing that with Ryan Kerrigan other than that record? 
You know, you just got to let, let bygones be bygones at some point. And the team also made a decision similar to that theme with Ruben Foster placing him on the injured reserve, effectively ending his 2020 season. Chris, Stupidity. do you feel like this is- Sorry. Say? Stupidity. That's what pisses me off from active aim from the pup. Absolutely. What a decision. You could have had him after week eight. Yep. Chris, it, do you it, feel like that move is best oh for business? God. Have we seen Lasso Foster in Washington? It, it makes me nervous that that is the case, honestly. Because, man, we are, we are so high on Ruben Foster, and he showed us in camp that he's not 100%. I mean, Mitch came on last week. He was talking about he could have fit a sh- he could have fit a sheet of paper under Ruben Foster's vertical. Mitch said he could probably jump higher than uh, than Ruben Foster. So, like, it, it does make me very nervous that his season is over already before he even before he even started the season, and and. You know, Ron Rivera has no investment in Ruben Foster. I mean, he also is, you know, he just cut guys for the same reason that Ruben Foster was cut from San Francisco. So I feel like there's that, like, that's kind of a oh, big elephant. That's low-hanging elephant. fruit. That's low-hanging fruit. I mean, R- Rivera said he talked to him. Ruben said Rivera came to him and they talked about it. But that's still an elephant in the room, man. Like, that doesn't just go away. That's in the back of Rivera's mind. And I don't think that's the reason he put him on IR. I think that was truly because of his injury and he hasn't been very productive in camp. But I don't think we're – and I said this, when we signed him, signed him, it is Junior Gallette all over again. We will never see him be on the field. And I know Junior played a few snaps for us, but we will never see Ruben Foster make an impact. You would for think he team. played a decade. Yeah. I mean, it, it felt like <laughs> he was on doesn't tweet years, like Junior but... Gallette once he leaves. My God, <laughs> holy – I've interviewed that guy, but, man, he, he is a handful. Um, Rodney, would there be a diverse room of middle linebackers? between, you know, Khalid Hudson, John Boskett, Sean Dale Hamilton. Who do you see emerging as the true Mike of Jack Del Rio's defense? Cole Holcomb. I yeah. like that, man. I like it. I, I'm, I'm still surprised that he's not starting. Uh, they got Bostic listed as a starter. And, like, I mean, you said it earlier that uh, Rivera saying, hey, it's a it's a fluid depth chart. Uh, hopefully it applies to defense as well. Um, but Holcomb was a, a very pleasant surprise last year. Um, I mean, Bostic performed well, um, but I think Holcomb will and should emerge as our Mike moving forward. I think he has really good uh, football IQ and intelligence, and he was he seemed to be in the right place at the right time many times last year. And I mean, in a three and thirteen season, you try to look at bright spots. I think that he was one of them on the defensive side of the ball that we can look to build upon, but him not being listed as a starter is uh it's not concerning, but it's a little surprising for me. I feel like Bostic is Zach Brown without the baggage. You know, I mean he makes he makes all the tackles. He does everything he's supposed to. And I, I feel like that's what kind of makes him a coach favorite. And you know, he's done really well in training camp and he's obviously, like I said, a favorite by the coaching staff. Um they also have Sean Dion Hampton and uh Kevin Pierre Lewis at outside linebacker. Any anything about that surprise either one of you? Kevin Pierre Lewis, journeyman. Yeah, and we never hear anything about this guy. I mean, he's he's a journeyman. Like the dude has not been a stud, and it's it's weird. It's it is the maybe the curse is lifted. Maybe people are coming to DC now and they got superpowers being en- enabled because <laughs> for years people would come here like this guy's a blue chip player. He's going to be great in DC. And he comes in and he just fucking falls off a cliff. Um, now, now we got people showing up that have been, you know, useless in other organizations and maybe they're truly picking up their, their true talent and they're actually capable or we suck really badly at that position. <laughs> I hope it's the former, not the latter. Um, so yeah, like that's surprising for me, you know, um, yeah, I, I did not expect Kevin Pierre Lewis to be a starting linebacker for us when he has been a journeyman throughout the league. But I mean, hey, the, the coaches are paying millions of dollars to make these uh these assessments. Hopefully, it's the right one. But that's a surprise for me. Hey, real, just... real, real quick, non football related, Rodney. I've never understood that saying. Is former the first thing you said and latter the second? Yes. Okay. No, I've never understood. Yes. He will yes. Die former, former, former yes. Or... Former is the first, latter is the second. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I, I had so much trouble with that. But I'm glad I got it now. I'm gonna take a note. Like, oh, yeah, like, my heart starts like, Did I mess up? <laughs> I, I wouldn't have known. I, I truly don't know. <laughs> like college education, don't let them fool you. Um, we don't over <laughs> I'm gonna Google it now just to make sure I'm right. I don't want I don't want to lie to the listeners, man. <laughs> We also found out today, and we're going to move on to cornerback, that uh, Kendall Fuller, currently dealing with a knee injury, uh, had limited snaps in practice. 
Uh, Chris, what is your panic level in Blacksburg after hearing that news? Um, I'm thinking we're going to need 15 sacks by our D-line in order to win this game. <laughs> if, if, if he's not playing, Carson Wentz will have a field day if he has the time. So I, I'm going to need Chase Young to set a rookie record for first first career game with the most sacks, honestly. I am, I'm, you know, I mean, I mean, I know everyone's kind of high on Darby. I, I mean, what, what else is there? I, I mean, people like Jimmy Moreland, but Kendall Fuller is by far our best cornerback. According to Madden, he's our free safety, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> outside that of Kendall Fuller. sucks, man. <laughs> it, I, I've played it twice. It, I'm not buying it. <sighs> outside of Kendall Fuller, you know, you got Ronald Darby, um, you know, veteran there. Um, Fabian Monroe, who's not had an ideal camp. And then once you get past him, you have Greg Stroman, Jimmy Moreland, Danny Johnson. And, uh, Roddy, you think it's safe to say that if we're in any position this season where all three of them are on the field at the same time, we're in trouble? <laughs> as long as that front seven pumps up, man, that's what it's going to – It's it's you go back to Carolina 2015, 16, whatever, where that front seven in, in Carolina was pretty dominant and, you know – um Norman looked like an absolute stud. I, he, he played within the scheme pretty well. I think that's what this position group is is going to be wholly relying upon. I mean, Darby, it's it's odd because you look at his his production and it it doesn't really uh, deserve glowing, you know, flowing reviews with all, but. I think he could be serviceable. Uh, Kendall Fuller on the outside doesn't really scare me, but I'm when he played last played in DC, he was our slot guy, and I remember losing you know my mind when he got traded for Alex. Um, but now he's coming back and expected to play on the outside. Um, but scheme matters, so if if they can scheme these guys into winning positions, I think we'll be fine with the group. Um, yeah, who, who's our slot cornerback? Is it going to be Jimmy Moreland? That's what that's what the overall consensus is so far. That's what I'm here. But like I said, this depth chart's unofficial. So I yeah, mean, we really don't know. To me, it's kind of a, a coin flip between Moreland and pretty much anybody else. I mean, obviously, you got to have – I mean, personally, I'd put Kendall in the slot, and I wouldn't even think about it. I mean, you got Fabian Moreau on the outside, but, I mean, he's a lot bigger, a lot more rangier, you know, re- pretty pretty good in man coverage. Can't say the same about zone. You got Darby on the other side who's lived up to the to to his bill of a second round draft pick. If he can stay on the field, man, he looks great. You know, yeah. he's a good corner. Absolutely. I think he perfectly filled the value that you have by Quentin Dunbar there, honestly. To me, the thing about the secondary that really stuck out to me, you know, we, we talked about Troy Epke earlier, we talked about Sean Davis. You know, everybody knows Landon's a shoe in over there, as well as the Shazer Everett, him being a team captain. Is Cameron Crow making the 53? Yes. That, and Sean Davis really like, took me off, that's, off guard. That's bad. That's it's it's insanity that yeah you got Troy Appy coming out of the, the, like a phoenix coming from the ashes, and you got you know Cameron Curl making the squad. Hey man, it's a it's a good thing. I think I think if the youth movement proves true, it's naive. I, typically every year I'm a homer, I'm an idiot, and I'm drinking vodka. And I'm saying we're gonna be twelve and four, you know, my verse <laughs> Russian accent, and we're we're fucking dog shit, horrible. Um, Maybe, maybe the youth movement is truly the way to go. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have a veil of optimism moving forward this season with the roster. But yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because we've been saying this entire podcast as far as like, hey, I'm surprised, I'm surprised, I'm surprised. Um, maybe that's a good thing, or maybe it won't be. So we'll you say, you shall say see. Ve- you say a veil of optimism. Well, I'm going to need yes. to keep that on because uh, with all 53 locked in, we look now to Sunday as we Let's take go. on the Philadelphia Eagles in an empty arena um, <laughs> stadium. Hey, it, it's um, been – hey, that's probably the, the first home field advantage we've had in a couple of years, having it being empty. So, yes, I, yes. I, dude, I was a season ticket holder. I love you, Redskins Nation, Washington Football Team Nation, addicts, boys and girls around the world. You suck when you go to games. You don't – those people – They don't show up. They don't show up, and they, if the, those who do – they're idiots who don't understand game situations. So it'll be third and four, and we're trying to convert. And these idiots are – they're chanting like we're at a high school game. Let's go, Haskins. Like, shut the f- up. Like, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> Sit down. Be quiet. We're trying to convert a third and short. Situational now, football, people. They have none. They have none. So, yeah, having an empty stadium, if this team t- can coalesce and – play hard for each other like they put team on the back of their jerseys in camp instead of their their player names if they buy into that and they're actually playing for the man to the left and the right i think we got a chance to do they're gonna something be playing special, for their head coach. they better be 
They better be Rivera strong, you know? I think it's interesting you said people were cheering for Haskins because I feel like at most home games you hear the opposing team. Yeah, I know. Defense. I, I was trying to be I – I actually, I didn't see Haskins play at all. I left last year, so I didn't I didn't see him. But uh, I guess Alex Smith and, you know, Colt McCoy, whatever it may be. It's just – when Alex got hurt, these idiots were cheering because they thought we had, like, a positive play. Yeah. I wish I could go back and, like, like fucking minority report and say, hey, here's Hologram Rodney. Look at my reaction. And I'm like, he broke his fucking leg. I'm looking at the screen and they're cheering and clapping that they thought we had a positive play because they're drunk idiots. What was killing me? I was there. I was at the Houston Texas game. Where I was yes, like, my absolutely. Buddy, my buddy had just bought his salute to service Alex Smith jersey. Oh, <laughs> my he God. Was, he was on suicide watch beside me. <laughs> and and, and le- leading into it, man, all you heard people was, take Alex Smith out. He sucks. Put in Colt McCoy, and then the second his leg snaps, it's like the entire demeanor changed. Yes. I mean, Washington fans truly are fickle, man, and they aren't showing up. And, and I feel like a lot of that does have to do with Dan Snyder. The game I went to last year, the Detroit Lion games, Haskins first uh, started at home. You know, I was a part of a, kind of a, a good pack of fans that were pretty loyal, and I didn't have a lot of those issues like you were talking about, thank God. But, yeah, man, they just got to show up better. You know, Philly six-point favorites going into this, but – they are limping into this season, guys. They have an array of injuries on the defensive side of the ball with guys like Willie Parks being out. You know, you got the exodus of um, Malcolm Jenkins going back to his old team, Saints. But uh, more importantly, you've got some injuries on the offensive side of the ball, on the offensive line particularly. We ran a poll on the page, and uh, 71.4% of our listeners think that Philly's injury woes will be the difference in the game come Sunday. Um Right guard Brandon Brooks being on the shelf. Matt Pryor, whose only NFL action was in a playoff loss in January – We'll be starting a right guard uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, not only are they, are they down the, starting their right guard, but Lane Johnson, right tackle, you know, all pro, missed this entire week week of practice with nursing a lower body injury. Um, we were talking about Jason Peters earlier having a contractual dispute after agreeing to play guard, and they just moved him out to left tackle. Um, if that hadn't happened, we'd really, oh, man, they'd really be screwed, especially with Andre Dillard being out with a bicep injury. Um, Rodney, do you think this gives the Washington football team a distinct advantage? Or you think that Coach Pedersen is just going to make it work? I mean, he is a Super Bowl head coach after all. Nah, we're going to beat the hell out of them. <laughs> 34 to 14. Oh, my we're gonna, God. We're, we're going to beat up on them. I, the hey, he it. I, 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 I take it back. You can edit it out then. But I think we're going to beat the hell out of them. Um, I don't know. I feel I feel different, man. It's Maybe it's the stupid optimist in me. Um, it's I'm not, That's the thing, man. Like, so – I I, I, I think that he's going to beat the hell out of Jason Peters all game. Um, I think he's going to have three quarterback pressures, one and a half sacks, and four tackles for loss. I think that's a hell of a stat line to come out. Hell yeah. You know, Jeez. especially if those tackles for loss, if those four tackles for loss are like on third downs Taylor, and they, they force punch difference. or something like that, dude, I'm, I'm ecstatic. That's, that's great. And here's the thing, man. I don't know Wentz's his record, and I'll try to look it up as I'm talking to you guys. Uh, his record versus us, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. It hasn't been many losses. Yeah, no. so I won't even look it up. It'll just waste time. But I still remember there was a, a play at FedEx where we had him dead to rights. Oh no! There had to be about five or six about. people on him. Oh, and Eli I, Manning does. Yeah, he just came out of the came out of nowhere, and I'm like. That We're cheering that he got sacked. This dude throws a touchdown. Yeah. And I'm like, what in the hell just Matt happened? Collins was that one crushed. Team. That one crushed me. I'll be honest. Oh, oh my god. Because he's been man. doing this all game. Yes. Eating, and I remember just watching them like swirl in on him. I was like, oh, we got him. We got him. And he just darts four three speed right out of the like that entire like. And then throws a laser. Yeah. I just. Oh my god. Um. That was his rookie year, I believe. It was. Either, it was was, was it? it? I don't, I don't know. Wait, I remember. It was, it was a few years ago. I think it was rookie year or second year when he was semi-healthy. I think he's taking enough beatings now or he's not the same Carson Wentz that we knew mm-hmm. then. Well, Carson Wentz is going to Carson Wentz. You know, he was an MVP candidate in 2017. Um, then his dad, Nick Foles, took over and you know, finishing the job for him. <laughs> I, I, I don't that. buy Wentz. I, I think you honestly should have traded him somewhere gotten some value for him, kept Nick Foles, keep the hot hand, keep the guy that's familiar with the offense. And that's why Nick Foles keeps getting jobs, man. You know, he buys into whatever offense he's in, and, you know, he, he's very selfless. And I feel like 
You know, you got the Carson Wentz and Zach Ertz show over there, and you don't even know if Zach Ertz is going to be here next season. That's another contractual dispute that Philly's got to worry about. Um, but as far as the mismatch with our, you know, the offensive line and the defensive line, our writer David Operman did a phenomenal piece on that over the Brawl Network.com. Make sure you guys check that out. Um, but something that um, Rodney was talking about, Chris, was that J- Chase Young and Jason Peters matchup. You know, that's a 16 year veteran in this league. You know, some laughed at us when we said that Chase would be the difference in a few games this season. Um, but now he's kicking off the season with a very favorable matchup, a guy who thought he was going to be playing guard this year. And, and, and COVID, you know, in this Astros season, Peters definitely doesn't have the matchup going into this. But do you think he's going to be able to keep the Predator in check? No, I don't think so. I, I think Chase Young is going to get his for sure, and he's definitely going to make an impact in this game. I mean, you can say Jason Peters is a um, is a wily vet, and you can say, like, you know, he made the, the shifts or whatever, but he didn't have a job not that long ago. I mean, we were even talking about – picking him up ourselves. So he may have been working out on the side or whatever, but he was kind of out of football for the entire off season. He was, you know, he was up to his own workouts and he wasn't working out with any under, un, un, under any coach, or any trainers or anything like that. So he was kind of up to him. I think, I think the uh, age is definitely hitting him hard. I think you can watch him. And even though he's in, uh, you know, pro bowler, uh, you know, whatever standards he has, I think you can definitely see the age get into him a little bit. He's a little slower, a little heavier, a little heavy footed. I think Chase Young is going to dominate, man. The only thing that will beat Chase Young is if Doug Peterson finds a way to game plan around him. And that's the same thing that we're dealing with. I think that's bootleg rights, quick passes. I think that's the only thing that's going to keep Chase Young nullified in this game. You got Jalen Rogers. You know, he's he's questionable as well. You know, Zach Ertz is healthy, but Alshon Jeffrey, you don't know what you're going to get out of him. I feel like Philly's got a lot of question marks, and we definitely have no room to talk. And when we were talking about Jason Peters a month ago, we were like, oh, man, he can come in and be our Donald Penn this year, fill in at left tackle until we can go out and draft somebody well, now. We're like, Donald oh, what Penn if wasn't all that great either. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean he, he, he kept us afloat. And, and, you know, now look at us. We're talking about Donald Penn. Oh, what, what a bum. I mean, we're talking about Jason Peters. What a bum. Chase Jones of course. Gonna rip him apart. <laughs> hey, hey, if he's not playing for for Washington, he's a bum. That, hey, that's that's, that's just the way it has that's, to be, man. That's the energy <laughs> I like, man. <laughs> you know, there's a do- well documented history between Lane Johnson and Ryan Kerrigan. Um, I think we can all say that the defensive line is going to have a big performance on Sunday. And Chris, I'll start with you. Who's it going to be? And give me a stat line. I know Ronnie kind of already did it, but I, what's your take? Are you talking about defensive line, like defensive end sacks and stuff? Yeah, whatever member you think of that defensive line is gonna is gonna show it on Sunday. I, I'm I'm not gonna go into all detail into uh you know tackles for loss and pressures and all that just because I I haven't put that much thought into it. But um, I honestly think Chase Young is gonna come out on top. Honestly, I think Montez is gonna have a day with pressures. I think you know Ionitis is gonna show out too. But I think Chase Young, man, he you know he's hungry. I mean, he said when he got drafted, like he's trying to break the rookie draft record for the most sacks. I think he's gonna come out the gate hot. I think he'll have something to prove against a, a wily vet like Jason Peters, who is honestly kind of on his last leg as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm going Chase Young on the way. I'll say, I'll say, um, I'll say two sacks for Chase Young. I, that, and you know, Jason Peters is a hell of a run blocker, but as a pass blocker, it, if if Chase Young does anything like he did in training camp to Jason Peters, that that dude is going to get murdered. I just don't think you know. We know there are some you know. Uh, versatile quarterbacks out there and I think at one time and we just talked about it Carson Wentz was that you know mobile quarterback I just don't think he is anymore man I don't I don't think he's going to try to even escape the pocket I think he's going to be like Kirk Cousins and just fall down when someone gets in his bubble and Jay Young is going to get a couple sacks off of that and I mean you look you know past that too just like you were talking about run stops Jay Young is so um, known for his sacks and stuff but you look at his tape from Ohio State he was a hell of a run stopper we watched him tackle Adrian Peterson in camp, that video, I mean, shoot, maybe that's the reason AG, AP got cut. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, uh, Chase, Young is def- <laughs> Chase Young is definitely going to have an impact on this game. And, he and blew up I- Logan Thomas on that play, too, man. Chris doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> blocker, like we said earlier. <laughs> you, th- you think Chase is going to get that rookie sack record? I, I would like to think so. I'm, I'm going to hope so. He doubled Nick Bosa's production in Ohio State. And I know that's. Kyle well, that's, right here. But, but that's yeah, that's oh, man. That's I don't awesome. know, man. I think Chase Young is just gonna be that guy you gotta worry about. I, I think from day one, he's gonna show he is a man amongst boys when he's got certain people in front of him. And before that's we get exciting, in, man. That's so I exciting. Know. To When's the last too, time man? you could say that? When's the last time we could say that? You know, and be, beyond that, before Chase Young, we still talked about the defensive front last year. Yeah. 
Like we we had we, yeah like we we had a lot of optimism with Allen. I mean it was the law offices of uh, you know Allen Ionitis and Payne, um, and then you got Kerrigan and Sweat on the outside. We still had a lot of promise, Chase and then the Adam Catalyst. Chase Young he is truly the difference maker. And like you guys said, if if you're game planning for that guy, and now you have to have a running black chip block, you have to have a tight end double team or your your interior guard. What center is going to hold either Deron Payne or Ioannidis, you know, solo by themselves? They can't. It's they can't. That's Someone's what I'm saying. So it's three, period. Someone should, if they scheme them up the right way, someone should be free or at least have a shot at making a truly difference-making play every single snap for that front all, seven. You have all these smaller guys playing linebacker like Cleet Cutson. You know, he's got that speed, man. He can get through Sean Dion Hamilton, even though he's bulked up a little bit. He can get through, man, and 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 really disrupt Wentz. And I think that is going to be a key difference in the in the game. And before we get to our final predictions for the game, I'm going to talk about a, a few more factors that I feel like are going to be pretty important in this game. You know, these fantasy football drafts, man, a guy that was taken really high was Miles Sanders. And, and you know, I, I do think that there is a lot of upside with him, and I do think he's going to be the guy in Philly this year. Do you guys feel as if he's going to be kind of the – the X factor in this game, or how much? What do you see Miles Sanders' stat line being? I think he'll have a good game. Um, I don't think that it's going to be a fantasy, you know, expose where he's like, "Holy shit, the, the Washington front seven ain't what we thought they would be." Maybe um, twenty carries, seventy five yards ish. I, I think something like that. But hopefully, they come in. Um, in, in I, I think he'll have a little bit more pass catching um, abilities because I'm, I'm still unsure how we'll, we'll cover the pass out of the backfield with our linebacker core. Um, but I don't think that the running lanes are going to be as open and available as they were in previous years. I, I just, I'm, I'm a homer for Chase Young right now, but I truly think that he's that difference maker that's just going to make everyone else around him that much better. And they were already pretty damn good. And, you know, you got the defensive side of the ball for Philly. You know, like I said, Willie Parks probably not going to play in this matchup. At least that's what the injury report states. Um, you, you know, and you lose Malcolm Jenkins, man. People are not talking about that. That guy was the quarterback of the defense. You know, I mean, he was so vital to that Jim Schwartz-led defense. It, 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 I don't feel like it was talked enough, uh, talked about enough this offseason. I feel like you're going to feel his absence. You know, they, they've got a very, very young secondary and we'll get into that in a second with our predictions um so sunday september 13th 1 p.m at fedex field who wins between the washington football team and the philadelphia eagles chris i'll start with you with your final prediction you can't go back on it we're recording it this is it this is your final prediction all right here we go i would i would have said before the injuries that washington would sneak out with the wind with a margin of about three but Based on the news we've heard, we've heard with all the injuries and such, and just the you know new season zero and zero record we got right now, and that optimism, I'm gonna go. Washington wins 24-17. 24-17. All right. Um, completely fair. I I'll go back to Rodney. I know he said 34-14 earlier. Is he sticking to that? Absolutely. We ain't the Redskins no more, but we are still bringing out the damn war drum. We will beat the hell out of these Eagles. We need to. I need I need something to smile about, man. 2020 has sucked. Um, I know it's overly optimistic. It probably will not happen. It may be closer, but if we could go in there and assert dominance when no one expects us to do such. I mean, NFL Network has us going 1-15. Uh, not, not winning, <laughs> so but one game. Usual. You know, we want, we're supposed to beat the Giants like the second game, but beyond that, we're supposed to get beat up every single week. Um, I was just looking at last year's head-to-head matchups. Um, we lost, I think, like it's like twenty-eight to twenty-three. Uh, our first game versus Philly last year, and then week sixteen, uh, we lost like twenty-seven to twenty or something like that. So they weren't really blowouts. Um, statistically, they look good, um, but I think that with the additions we have on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball, I think that they are greater than Philly's additions. So I'm still going to go with a blowout shock, the world victory for the Washington football team. And as much as I want to disagree with you guys, cause you guys know the kind of guy I am. I'm just going to put it like this Eagles bra. I want you to look at me. I want you to look at me good because there's one factor in this game that you cannot prepare for. And that is Terry McLaurin on Darius Slay. You cannot prepare for it. 
Terry McLaurin is the best wide receiver in the NFC East. And I don't care what anyone says. I, you can say it's Amari Cooper. You can say it's C.D. Lamb. You can say it's Darius Slayton if you want. I, it doesn't matter. One-on-one, -on -one, Darius Slay, your number one corner, one of the fastest corners in the NFL, one of the most lucratively paid corners in the NFL, cannot cover Terry McLaurin. And now you have a quarterback that isn't going to miss a 50-yard post to him, a quarterback that actually – is adequate enough to be in the offense. You can say what you want. You can, you can throw in the stat line. They have, they've had all offseason, man. And I promise you, and I'm talking to you, Eagles bra, Darius Slay is going to get destroyed by Terry McLaurin. And that, I can almost guarantee a victory because of that. That, that is the difference in this game, in my opinion, is that matchup on the outside. That is going to be a constant. That is going to be something Dwayne Haskins can look through the entire game. I love Darius Slay. I love his game. And he definitely respects Terry McLaurin, as, as, as any corner who faced him last year did. But one-on-one, -on -one, Terry owns him, man. I, I mean, when Darius went to go sign his new contract, you know, he probably called you and said, hey, Dad, can uh, you think one of the Eagles is a good idea? <laughs> so I, I think that is the difference in the game. And I think I put, yeah, 26-19 to 19, Washington football team. I, I think we start off with a win in Philly for the first time in a long time. I think we start off the, the first half hot, a lot like last year. But I feel like just because of the distinct difference in coaching, you know, we're actually going to have – Second half adjustments, if you don't believe me, go watch that Panthers special on Amazon where Rivera's screaming at everyone like they're playing in the Super Bowl. I think you've got a well-coached Washington football team against a pretty well-coached Philadelphia Eagles team that just simply doesn't going to have the talent on the field. So I, I think, in my bold prediction, Chase Young, fumble return, touchdown late to ice the game. Dude, then I'm, I just pulled – before you close, I pulled up a Darius Slay soundbite um, when he was still with the Lions before free agency and the trade, whatever. But he said, to be honest, the whole year besides Keenan Allen, Terry McLaurin was the hardest one that he covered all year. A rookie. That's the fastest corner in the league other than maybe Byron Jones. Yes. You're talking about a third-round draft pick, man. Yeah. When, when Ocho Cinco's looking at you saying, damn, that kid can run routes. That's one of the most dynamic receivers of all time saying that about a third round draft pick. They're supposed to be a gunner. Terry is blown through any expectations set for him. And I think that he is going to wear Darius out. Five, five catches for 72 yards, you know, versus Detroit last year. No touchdowns. But Darius Slay said, hey, he broke free multiple times. Yeah, if he was, was targeted, there. he would have scored at least twice on me. At least twice. There were so many moments where you could tell that Dwayne, you know, his, his naivety kind of was a factor because he didn't know where to put the ball. And there was – I'm telling you, man, go back and watch that game. You know, I think NFL, whatever it is, is free right now. I know Chris no, watches it. You know, you got to pay now. Oh, you got to pay now. Yeah, Either way, you can find the highlights yeah, online. The there was so, oh, man, those bastards. <laughs> there were so many moments where Terry had broken free of Darius Slay. His stat line should have been better than it was in the Miami game. So – I think Terry McCorn makes a difference. I think Chase Young says hello from Washington, and, and, and then we start off 1-0, and I think our post-game podcast is going to be nothing but positive. And I think no fans there is for the best. I don't want people sitting there arguing about a name. I really don't. I want it to be about football. And I think this is a situation where it is about football. It is about the team, like on the back of their jersey. So, But before we sign off, um, I know Chris and I had our fancy drafts this weekend. I'm in about five leagues. Chris, you had a nice little setup for your draft, man. I, I pretty sleek um gotta ask you rodney um did you draft any watch the football team players I did uh dwayne haskins and terry mclaurin what rounds um haskins is, my, haskins is my backup i i did get the sean watson i'm gonna start him tomorrow the same um, thing and um mclaurin i think was my third round pickup dude we literally did the same thing oh my god what, what about you chris yeah, um, so I really wanted to hit Antonio Gibson in a late round because there's not a lot of good running backs out there. I mean, pretty much every running back went top five, and I was, you know, 10th or later in both of my drafts. So I was going to hit Antonio Gibson late, but I am in a couple drafts with several Washington fans, so I think they were thinking the same thing. So they, they stole McLaurin and Gibson from me. Um, in my one league, I picked up Sims late, and I picked up, I know this is kind of ironic, but I picked up J.D. McKissick late just because oh, oh he's not starting. He's not starting. Don't worry. But I just I was very, uh, very weak on running backs. So I went and picked him up just as a fallback. I was in a very, very deep league. And, and I, I don't know that I'm going to hate saying this or I'm going to love saying this. Antonio Gibson is my RB1 in one of my leagues. And, I would put him there. I would put him there. 
he's going to get the touches, man. And, you know, we got an art, we got a couple articles coming out by our guy, David Open later this week. We've got some fantasy intel. Um, you guys regret the picks? And is, is there, would you tell anybody listening to take anybody you took? Or if you had to pick one Washington football team player for people to select, who would it be and why? For me, it's going to be uh, Terry McLaurin because we know what he can do. I think Dwayne, my, my other Washington pick, um, he's sort of uh, a guy w- with a expected high ceiling, but he's still kind of unknown. He he's, he ended last year strong, um, but, but I'm, I wouldn't have him as a, a fire starter. But Terry Mack, I think you can, which is sort of a hypocritical statement because if Terry Mack's having a good season, so is uh, Dwayne Haskins as well. So it's it's – a little bit of trepidation. I like I like Terry Mack. I've never heard of Terry Mack before. I, I I definitely think Terry is the easiest one for sure. I mean, he's definitely wide receiver three in my book. Some people are gonna tell me I'm silly for taking Gibson the first. I I love Dwayne in really deep leagues as like QB two because if like you said if, if if Terry's having a great year, that means Dwayne is as well. But it really begs the question: Do you guys feel like Terry McLaurin's fantasy value is gonna go down now that he's gonna be garnering more attention from secondaries? No. I, I, I have saved that line, if not better. What's that? I said you still see the same stat line, if not better. You think he finishes over a thousand yards? Absolutely. Okay. Chris, Absolutely. Any Washington football team player you would you would tell someone to take if they were in their draft right now? Terry McLaurin is definitely the easiest option, but I'm just going to go against the grain against y'all. Um, I'll go Antonio Gibson. Uh, I just think um, running backs are rare in the league. I mean, people go Christian McCaffrey, Saquon, Zeke, Dalvin Cook. Uh, Camara, like if, if those guys are off the board, you're kind of sitting there wondering who you're going to pick. Yeah. Um, so I think a late round guy would be Antonio Gibson, just because, like you said, Parker, he's going to get the touches. That's one. That's something that you know. That's all that matters. Yeah. Once you get past those few running backs, you got to get guys that are just starters. You got to get guys that are going to get the touches because you know teams are going to run the ball at, at some point. So you got to go get starters, and and um, Antonio Gibson is going to get touches both running the ball and I believe receiving the ball too. And those points count the same. So, yeah, I think uh, Gibson would be a fun one to go get try out at the flex or something, or maybe maybe even keep on your bench for a game or two, see how he does, and, and maybe you know throw him in there week three. So, yeah, I think uh, Terry McLaurin is definitely the easy option. But I really wanted Gibson, and kind of kind of got unlucky that he got taken so early. He's going to be a great flex by the end of the year, mark my words. But those are great options by both of you guys. And unfortunately, you know, time goes by when you're having fun, but we got to wrap up this episode. So, Rod, thank you so much for coming on, man. You know, we have just mere days until Washington football returns. And we hope for both of our sakes that we get a much better on-field product than we saw last year. Absolutely, man. Can't I cannot deal with another 3-13 and season. And 1-15 and will uh, that'll gut my soul. Can't have that happen. <laughs> Well, we look forward to following you and the rest of the guys at Redskins Vax this season, man. Um, tell people you, man. where they can find you. Absolutely. They can find me uh, on Twitter, Redskins Addicts. Uh, and then if you're on Facebook, the same. Just search for the name Redskins Addicts to see either the page or the group. But we're more active in the group for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure having you on. Can't wait to have you back on so we can talk football instead of just projections. Um, but that will yeah. be all for this week's episode of Washington Brawl. Make sure you give us a five-star review and subscribe and whenever you're listening to us on. Our episodes are now available in their entirety on YouTube as well as our Washington Brawl Madden 21 Game of the Week series. So make sure you guys check that out and listen to me blow blood vessels in my head when I'm down seven and fourth. Um, make sure you go over to www.brawlnetwork.com, check out our writer Dave over from his latest, and check out the fantasy football content he's got pumping in the coming days. Um, also, pick up some merch, support your boys. Um, just got my brand new uh, why it's a little wrinkled. I think I just got it at the dryer for people that are watching. Um, yeah, I'm doing terrible right now. Jeez. Edit that out. Got our white Washington ball shirt. Um, white, black, burgundy. So make sure you guys pick that out and support your boys. Um, we'll hit you guys with our post-game podcast and reactions to the week one on Monday, September 14th. This has been the Washington Ball Podcast presented to you by the Brawl Network.